Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Mitch Album is the author of The Little Liar, a novel. This was the Zivi's book club pick for November. I hope you all read it. Author, screenwriter, philanthropist, journalist, and broadcaster Mitch Album is an inspiration around the world. He is the author of numerous books of fiction and nonfiction, which have collectively sold more than, wait for it, 40 million copies in 48 languages worldwide. He has written eight number one New York Times bestsellers, including Tuesdays with Maury, the best-selling memoir of all time, which topped the list for four straight years and celebrated its 25th anniversary in 2022. He has also written award-winning TV films, stage plays, screenplays, a nationally syndicated newspaper column, and a musical. He appeared for more than 20 years on ESPN and was a fixture on The Sports Reporters. Through his work at the Detroit Free Press, he was inducted into both the National Sports Media Association and Michigan Sports Halls of Fame and was the recipient of the Red Smith Award for Lifetime Achievement. Following his best-selling memoir, Finding Chica, and Human Touch, a weekly serial written and published online, which raised nearly $1 million for pandemic relief, he returned to fiction with The Stranger in the Lifeboat, which debuted at number one on the New York Times bestsellers list after being number one on Amazon. His much-anticipated new novel, set during the Holocaust, came out in the Welcome, fall. Welcome, Mitch. Thank you so much for coming back. Mitch spends the majority of his time, time in books. philanthropic We're here work to discuss since 2006. Your latest novel, the Little Nine Liar, Charitable which, by the way, is my Michigan, November book club under his pick because I'm Detroit S A Y Detroit umbrella, including the nation's it. first so medical so clinic for homeless children. Thank you for children. coming on. He also Good created to see you a dessert again. shop and popcorn line. Thank you for the selection. Thanks for asking me to come back. Fun programs for Detroit's most underserved citizens. Please tell listeners what your book is about. Well, it's about a little boy, a home to six. Two children, boy which in he Greece visits during every World month War II, without exception. Who's never told a lie in his life. And the Nazis come and invade his city, Thessalonica, Greece, and they find out that he, they've got this little honest kid who's never told a lie in his life. And they basically kidnap him and trick him into standing on the train platform and telling all the Jews who have been rounded up there that they're going to a safe place, that there's going to be jobs and it's going to be good and their families are going to be together. And he believes this is true because he has no reason to suspect otherwise. And they say, if you do this, then your family will be returned to you and everything will be fine. And he does this for train after train until the last train out when he sees the Nazis putting his own family on the train and he runs to join them and he's grabbed by the Nazi and he finds out that they're actually being sent to their death. And they get sent away and he is forced to stay behind. And from that moment on, this little boy who never total lie in his life, can't speak the truth anymore. He loses the ability to say anything true. It like chokes in his throat. And it follows him from that point forward through the war, all the decades that follow and all the consequences that happen to him as a result of this trick and, and, and how he, you know, what happens when we lose the truth in our lives, which is kind of the biggest theme of the book. And you follow his family and what happens to them, these sort of dual timelines, well, same timeline, but dual narratives of Correct. where life separates and how it's one small thing, you know, where he was at the time versus where he was, you know, that he was hiding in this cabinet when the Nazis came in and took the family to, you know, the, essentially the ghetto until they were deported and he wasn't there. And what if he had been? What if he hadn't been in that cabinet at that time and how life, especially then, I mean, not especially, but how then that it was a life or death timing all the time. Yeah. You know, he's the central character. There's four characters in the in the book that the book follows literally from 1936 all the way to the to to, you know, the mid 80s. And it's how they intertwine with one another. So there's him. His name is Nico. There's his older brother, 
whose name is Sebastian, who's nowhere near as honest as him, Mm -hmm. but ends up getting sent to the concentration camps and blames his brother for lying to them. There is a girl named Fanny who's in love with both of them, and she is put on the train as well, but is thrown out the window in an attempt to escape and actually spends her time during the war running away and trying to find her way back to Nico. Nico's trying to find his way back to his family. And then the fourth character is the Nazi uh, officer who engineered all this and how they continue to intertwine with one another during the war, after the war, and the years after, how they try to piece their lives together. And they all end up sort of coming back together in this uh, big climactic scene at the end, which outside of the climactic scene in the end is very true about what happened to people during that stretch of time. You know, there was no such thing as forgetting what happened during that war, no such thing as, uh, for, for Jewish victims to uh, as forgetting what they went through. And yet each one of these characters has to deal with it differently. Nico just blanks it out and basically just lies his way through the rest of his life. Sebastian becomes a Nazi hunter and, and dedicates himself to finding these people, including his brother, who he thinks is one of them. And Fanny moves between the two of them, you know, trying to understand what happened to her and what happened to them. And, you know, the overall theme of it is that truth is an essential part of our lives and honesty with one another is an essential part of our lives. And when we lose that and we start lying to one another, whether individuals or countries, we pay a huge price. And uh, I had no idea it was going to be as relevant today when I started it as it's turned out to be. I thought it might, might be relevant because of the politics of the or world, you know, where everybody is sort of choosing their own truth now. Uh, it's become even more relevant uh, accidentally uh, with the timing of the release of the book. Oh, well, it's hard to take the Holocaust and everything, all the atrocities and the camps and everything. I've watched Endless as a Jewish woman and just as a citizen of the world who is deeply empathetic. I've read many books and watched many vi- movies and just have immersed myself in this as part of the never forget, but also just out of human interest and, and compassion and all of that. Um, and there's the question like, well, how can anyone write this? What is the new take on it? How can someone, what is the new, like, how can this book do something new? So tell me how you decided to tackle this and the way you came into it and and, and all of that. It's a really good question. And uh, as a writer, I went through the very same machinations that you just kind of expressed. I knew that at one point in my life, I wanted to set a story during World War II with the Holocaust as a backdrop. On the other hand, I didn't want to write another Holocaust book. Mm-hmm. Not that the, the ones that have come before me aren't great. They are. But I didn't want to just write something that was the, the fill in the blank of Auschwitz, you know, uh, because somebody has done that really well prior to me. And I also didn't want to just tell a story that was set the whole time during the concentration camps and followed that familiar pattern of, you know, ghetto, concentration camp liberation end you know first of all there was no end with liberation uh, uh, of the holocaust that was the beginning uh, for the people who survived then it was the rest of their lives so i said I, you know i waited years honestly to to, to write this to be i didn't because I, I couldn't find a story that i felt was original enough and then when i i happened to go to a, I think it was in yad vashem in, in israel on a, on a book tour trip that i was there and i went to the museum and saw some of the testimonies of different people there. And one of them was saying how they use Jewish people to to lie to their own people about getting on these trains. Because after all, if a Nazi guard is standing there and he's goes, you get on the train and you think you're going to your death, you might as well die on the platform. You know, you might as well fight. And, 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 and why did so many people not fight? Well, they were tricked. They were lied to. And to use your own people to lie to you, I thought, well, now that's something that I haven't really scene. So that was the germ of the idea. And then I had lived in Greece way back when in an earlier part of my life when I was a musician. And I had uh, I was a I was a nightclub singer and a piano player uh, on the Isles of Crete. (laughs) It was a it was a whole different time. I know it's probably hard to imagine for people (laughs) writer, but I had a whole different existence. One day I'm gonna write that book. And so I always knew about Greece, maybe more than the average, you know, American guy who's not Greek. And a lot of people don't realize that Greece, number one, was decimated by the Nazis the same way 
uh, as other countries in Europe were. But two, the most Jewish city in all of Europe was actually Thessalonica. Uh, that was the only city in all of Europe that had a Jewish majority population. They were the majority. And can you imagine a city that had a majority Jewish population having itself wiped out? I mean, you know, there were 55 something thousand Jews there and there were 1500 left when the Nazis were done with them. And so I said, all right, let me set a book in Greece. Very few Holocaust books are are set there. Uh, Let me focus on the idea of truth and lies and how Sadly, it was Goebbels who said this very famous quote, or at least is attributed, you know, a lie told once is easily seen as a lie, but a lie told a thousand times becomes the truth. Mm. And that's exactly what the Nazis did, you know, by repeating the same lie over and over about whose fault uh, Germany was and whatever, and how they were, they were just purifying the country. And this was all for the good of the state and all that. And meanwhile, it was just mass murder. And that's kind of, you know, we live in a world like that now where people justify their actions with their own truths. And they just sort of say, well, this is the truth and accept it. And people say, yeah, all right, that's my truth. That's my cable TV news station. That's my uh, uh, an a- analyst. And, and, and that's how I'm going to look at the world. And the idea of there being a pure truth has disappeared in place of I'm going to pick my truth and I'm just going to follow that. And that's a very dangerous pattern. And so I wanted to show how it was the precursor of that already happened. We already saw what the world can be like when people start to believe something that is not only not true, but is evilly not true. And so I thought, okay, there's a story that at least I haven't read before. I can start to write it. And that's how I approached it. Wow. Well, the end result is it is original and it does it's told in a way also with all the different characters and you know the intertwining lives and the thought provoking nature of what you were saying in the aftermath what happens what are the long term effects i mean there are also all these studies on you know children of survivors and like the ripple effects of generational trauma which is now in the news all the time and that's you know this it this like tiptoes to towards that not you know in full but you know what are the lasting effects and and to your point of of sort of hatred i mean it's ter- it's terrifying so and to think that it couldn't happen again and then things happening today it's it's just it's all very very terrifying and i feel like the scenes in your book are just incredibly sort of prophetic and just i don't know it's it's very very important especially now to read this book i feel well i i know as i'm listening to you first of all i appreciate the kind words but then i'm also getting a little scared that i don't want my readers who are used to reading my books to feel like Oh my God, he's written a terrifying book. And uh, no, I'm terrified. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, but it's something that I think about, not because you said it, but, you know, sometimes when people hear the word Holocaust or whatever, oh, that's too hard to read or I don't want to read it. Uh, you know, I tried to make, first of all, there's a very, very uh, sweet isn't the right word, but I think en- engaging love story between Fanny and, well, first the older brother and then Nico. She spends her whole life basically trying to find him again because he saved her life during the war. And the redemption that you get from love, which is the flip side of what you were talking about, about, well, how do you survive something, the worst thing that you can possibly think? I mean, if someone can think of something worse than what happened during the Holocaust, send it to me in a letter because I'll write a book about it because I can't imagine it. You know, it's, it's, it's horrific. And yet people did live, you know, in Viktor Frankl's book and all that proves, you know, that there's life beyond that. And But but what kind of life and how do you get back from that? And the second half of the book is all about that, you know, mm-hmm. what, what you do with this tragedy or the result of these lies. And hopefully, if you agree with me, you read it, you know, in the end, it, it has a, a, a redemptive, positive message about it. It's not just horrific or terrible or terrifying scenes or things like that. I think you need those kinds of scenes here and there to set off, you know, the love that comes later and how beautiful that is, you know, that someone could survive that and still have the capacity to love or the capacity to be kind. And and Nico becomes this almost um, great Gatsby kind of figure, you know, like mm-hmm. he survives the war by lying. He actually finds his way back back to a concentration camp. His family was sent to one. He was spared. And then he spends the whole war lying his way into a concentration camp, trying to find his family with tragic results. And then he ends up in America. And where does a liar go in America? Hollywood. 
uh, you know, because it's perfect. And he ends up becoming this very, very successful but reclusive movie maker, you know, like the head of a studio, but nobody mm -hmm. really ever spends time with him or knows him, whatever. He keeps changing his name and and he's very mysterious. And you don't know what he's really doing with his time. It just seems like it's like, well, that, you know, all he does is make up lies. And he can't even he can't even answer if they say, like, you know, what do you have for lunch today? And he if he had soup, he'll say pizza just because he can't tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And yet all this time, there's something going on. I don't want to ruin the book for anybody, but there's something going on with him that, that you know, is redemptive. And when he gets to see Fanny again, there's this beautiful love story that they, you know, they pretend they don't know each other because neither one wants to bring up, you know, the terrible things that have happened. And I thought that that was also interesting, too, to do a love story where n neither party acknowledges that they know each other and yet they fall in love with each other. I've not seen that before. So, so uh you know, there's many things besides the, you know, the, the the awful things that people went through during that time. Yes. And I did not mean to overly emphasize. Those were just pieces of it. It was a beautiful love story. I mean, essentially, it's about people, right? It's about people's lives. And even if you go through something, there's the rest, you know. So, no, I did not mean to overemphasize. No, we have movie stars and really close friendships and, you know, Fanny, not to give things away, but the relationship of, of the woman with Fanny and how that stayed over time as well and just the good nature of people, the desire to help and all of that, it shines through completely. So, no, it is not just about that. It's about life and it's about what's important to us and what it means to be sort of a good person in, in the end and how that can manifest itself in so many different ways. What does it mean to sort of be good? How do you give back? And all of that. I feel like there are a lot bigger questions. Yeah, it's also narrated by a truth, which is uh, something I tried once before in one of my books, a number of books ago. I wrote a book called The Magic Strings of Frankie Presto, and I had the music was the narrator because mm -hmm. it was a book all about a guitar player. And I really liked that voice. It gave you like a perspective that was different from either the third person or the first person. And so in this case, truth is the narrator of the book. And so truth is constantly sort of talking to the audience and saying, you know, why do you abuse me the yeah. way that you do? You know, and I was when the angels all gathered together and, and God was trying to decide whether or not to create man. Righteousness said, yes, create man. Man will be righteous. And, and you know, other attributes said, yes, create man, absolutely create man. And only I said, don't create man because he'll become a liar and he'll destroy me. And what did God do? God threw me out of heaven and cast me down to to earth, which is an old parable that, you know, I, I didn't invent it. It exists in various forms. But I always thought that that was interesting, that truth would be the one virtue that would say, man can't handle me. Mm -hmm. And so don't bother. And so it, it narrates the story from that. And it's really, I found that voice to be a really interesting character to write in because truth obviously knows everything that really went on inside the heads and hearts of all the characters. And so it has a unique perspective to tell the story. Very true. It was really powerful. How did you go about writing this? Did you know Truth was going to be the narrator? And yeah. you did you knew from the start. Yeah. That was from the start. I knew there's a, a lines early in the book, you know, you can trust the story you're about to hear. You can trust it because I'm the only thing you can trust. And I, I knew I wanted to include that line. And, you know, there's sort of like when you write a book, there's sort of, for me, I, everybody does it differently, but there's sort of like uh, anchor sentences that you know you want to say and you plot, you kind of stick them in the ground and one goes here and one goes there. And then you, you kind of write in between them and find your way to them. And and th that I, that was one of them. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, a, a man to be forgiven will do anything. You know, there was there's when I went to Salonica to research this book, there's this big structure there called the White Tower and you can't miss it. It's 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 spectacular. It's big, round kind of fortress, Byzantine fortress. And I asked my guide, you know, what's the story about that? And she told me this amazing story that for years it was built in the 15th century or something. And for hundreds of years, it was a prison. And they used to call it the Red Tower because there was so much blood 
shed inside and outside. They used to hang people from the outside of it, and, and, and you know, and people died there. And then sometime during the 1800s, whatever, it was so filthy on the outside that they wanted to paint it, but they couldn't find anybody who wanted to do such a difficult task. And there was a prisoner inside the prison who volunteered to paint it by himself, to paint it white, on the condition that if he if he completed the task, they would forgive him and let him go. And they agreed. And he spent, you know, however, a year or whatever by himself painting this tower white and was finally let go. And this becomes a story in the book that repeats over and over that a man to be forgiven will do anything. And and that becomes a theme uh, for Nico, you know, who deep down is, you know, can't forgive himself for telling these lies, even though they weren't his fault and what he'll do to be forgiven. And I think that that's a theme that we have in, in our lives as well. What will we do to make up for a sin that we that we realize we committed? You know, how far will we go? Some people spend their whole lives in retribution, you know, for something that they felt that they did when they were younger. You know, some people who feel like uh, they were bad parents, you know, spend their whole lives being trying to get great grandparents so that they can make up for it. You know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that we sort of do that. And I, I just thought that that story in Greece, which was such a great, you know, setting, uh, you know, a, a guy who you can just see that guy in the tower every day trying to paint over thinking, if I just can finish this, I'll, I'll be free, you know, and uh, it plays a big part in the, in the story. I didn't realize that was true. Yeah, it's true. Sorry. Even more powerful to know that. Yeah. Are there things in your life for which you're seeking forgiveness? Yeah, many, <laughs> many. And also, you know, even uh, making up for missed opportunities, you know, like we, when I was, when my wife and I got married, we weren't able to have children and, you know, sort of accepted that that was, well, that's the way it's going to be. But I always also felt a little bad that maybe I kind of dragged my feet when we got married. And, you know, maybe if we got married sooner or something would have been, would have happened differently. And, um, then in our, my 50s, uh, I ended up taking over an orphanage in Haiti, quite by accident. It's a whole other story. And all of a sudden, I have all these children in my life. Now I have 65 at a time. You know, we have three right upstairs here now living with us. We've got 13 out in the state here in college and another 60 down in Haiti that I go visit every month. And I have so many kids in my life that sometimes I wonder if I'm not doing that because. It's a bit of a makeup for, you know, an earlier part of my life or something I felt that I did wrong. You know, I hadn't thought about that until you asked me. But yeah, I think everybody has something that they're trying to uh, atone for in some way, you know, even if it really wasn't a sin. And, you know, Nico certainly does that. And in fact, all three of the characters do. You know, the only one who does it is the Nazi who continues to be the Nazi <laughs> all through his life. He just wants to. You know, but even his way, he's trying to, you know, get back to what he believes is, uh, you know, he wants a, he wants a second right to appear and, you know, and, 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 and bring this all back. And it also uh, explores the idea, which, I, you know, a lot of people didn't realize until Al Pacino and the, that gang made that show, The Nazi Hunters, that, you know, Americans did harbor Nazis and brought them over after the war because they wanted to fight the Russians. And 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 kept them here with phony names and phony. I mean, you know, and never made them pay for their crimes because they used them, you know, as scientists to try to spy on the Nazis. And and he's one of them. And so a continued lie, you know, goes on and on, even even for him. I was hoping that part was not true. <laughs> no. In fact, almost everything in the book is true except the characters and the way they played out. You know, I don't know if I, I don't know what qualifies you as historical fiction. It seems like a very lofty <laughs> word to me. And I don't, I don't think of myself as that kind of a writer, but I realize, like both in Frankie Cresto and in The Little Liar, you know, I, I spent an inordinate amount of time on research, making sure that all the backdrop stories were accurate. And, you know, from the dates that things happened, to even the little small anecdotes like about the White Tower or things like that. It was, it's all true. And so I don't know if that makes it historical fiction or not, but there's a lot of history actually in the book. And I think when you're, when you're writing about times like that, the truth is more interesting than something that I could think up. You know, It just rings. It's like a real bell versus a plastic bell. 
You know, a real bell just has a certain sound and you can ring a plastic bell or hit a synthesizer note that's supposed to sound like a bell. But there's something about the real ring of a bell that sounds different. And there's something about, you know, using real events, but mixing them into your fictional characters that um, rings more true. And it's interesting you say, I didn't realize that that was true, but it felt true in the book, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, it actually was. That's what. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't doubt. I don't know. I, I I don't know. I just didn't even think. I thought it was just such a great story that it couldn't be true. <laughs> like, oh, Those that's the a perfect, guys. you know, yeah, that's a perfect, uh, you know, that, that, that shows us so much. It ties in so well. It couldn't be actually what happened. Yeah. So that's funny. Wow. Well, did you ever get sort of emotional and teary-eyed writing your way through these scenes? I mean, like, and I don't mean to harbor on even the, even the wonderful scenes, even the ones that just move you sort of emotionally, because I felt very moved. Yeah, I did. First of all, you know, I'm a brother and uh, I have, you know, a kid brother and we've had our share of, it's, you know, so, some things that we've had to endure together. And the, a brother relationship was very emotional for me to write you know, because you had an older brother who really didn't forgive the younger brother, but his whole anger towards him all his life was was falsely based. He didn't realize he thought his brother was lying because he was cooperating with the Nazis. And the bro- his lo- younger brother, Nico, didn't know that he was being tricked. And this hatred that boils between these brothers for decades is all based on the same lie that the Nazis perpetrated. And so that was painful to write because of brother relationship. You know, I have a, I have a, a brother who I adore and, and, you know, the way that they ultimately finally come together at the end was a very, very emotional scene for me. And writing that love story between, you know, a woman who was, it reminded me of uh, the character that Diane Keaton played in Reds, you know, when she's uh, with John Reed and she's in love with John and she, she crosses Siberia to find him in a, in a prison cell well, Fanny in my book sort of does the same thing. I mean, she literally comes from a little village in Austria and travels across the world to try just on the belief that Nico is alive somewhere and that he saved her life on the banks of the Danube River in, 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 in Hungary when they were shooting Jews in the head and having them fall in the river. And 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 so she remembered seeing him and then she fainted and, and she never she didn't know what happened to him. And she uses that small little sliver of a memory and she's somewhere inside of her. She's sure that he saved her and spends years searching for him only to be proven correct. And so, you know, that stuff when she finally sees him and, and they meet each other and and they don't acknowledge each other, you know, and she says to him, I don't know, I've been too much away, but there's a moment where she says, don't you want to know my name? Mm-hmm. That is, it's not necessary. And, you know, that like I get chills when I'm even talking about it because, you know, you create these characters and. And, you know, they're they're deeply in love with each other, but they can't express it. And of course, the ending, which I don't want to go into, was very, very emotional to write. And so, yeah, I kind of find to be that uh, if you're not crying a little bit, you know, if you're not, you're, then you're not doing a good enough job. If I can just be so dispassionate and just write it, but I expect all the readers to be moved. I'm not moved, but I expect you to be moved. That's not going to work. If, if you're not moved yourself, you don't feel a little chill or a little... A little tear or something when you're writing it, then it's probably not very good. <laughs> That's very good advice. Very good advice. Mitch, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the story, the journey, for giving hope in a dark time, honestly. And yeah, thank you for chatting about it with me. Well, thank you for spending time with me and making it your selection. I hope everybody enjoys it. It's always great to see you and hope we get a chance to talk again. You too. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 